PETA was launched back in 1980 with a mission to end animal suffering. But there's a big problem. When you look deeper into the track record of PETA, their mission starts to fall apart. PETA stands for People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, but there's nothing ethical about what they do to their animals. So let's find out what they're hiding. In 1969, Ingrid Newkirk was a 20-year-old girl looking to start a career as a stockbroker. Everything changed for her when her neighbors decided to move away. That's because those neighbors left behind a bunch of cats. Found the nearest animal shelter, drove them to the shelter, and it I was just astounded. It was filthy, it was harsh. They put the kittens down immediately when they took them into the back room. I was stunned, and so I applied for a job in the kennel. Over the next few years, she worked her way up to running the shelter, and she turned the place around. But this is still years before PETA even got started, so let's fast forward to 1980. Throughout her time working with the animal shelter, Ingrid came to a realization. You shouldn't just be being kind to animals. We are animals. We need to stop seeing them as hamburgers and handbags and tools for research. We need to see them as other individuals and treat them with respect. Leave them in peace. PETA was born, but how could they make a name for themselves? Rumor had it that a local research facility in the DMV was abusing monkeys in the process of their experiments. So Ingrid's partner in PETA, Alex, went to try and get a job there. Quickly it became clear that things were really, really bad there. 17 monkeys being kept in tiny cages with broken wires, all while being sliced open and shocked, supposedly for research purposes. They collected photos of this research and got the police involved. Because of this, they were able to get the researcher criminally charged with animal abuse. As quickly as PETA was created, it was on the front page of worldwide newspapers. But that was still just the beginning. As it turned out, they'd been consulting with a vet who had said the monkeys were never in danger of dying and seemed well-fed and healthy. They didn't get the answer they wanted, so they went on the attack. Ten days after the raid, a judge ordered that the monkeys get returned to the research lab and suddenly the monkeys had gone missing. The monkeys had been stolen back by PETA, and even when they got what they wanted, it still wasn't enough. But their shady tactics were overlooked by the media. So with all their new support and funding, they took $150,000 to develop a synthetic frog for school dissections. They were putting in the work and making serious strides to protecting animals. Everything was going great for PETA. but. That was about to change. I'll be honest, their history is really long. I mean, they were founded in 1980 and it's 2023, so let's skip ahead a bit. Campaigning for new supporters is like the basis of any charity. So I'm gonna show you three of their campaigns and I think you're gonna get a pretty good idea of what PETA actually stands for. And hey, just a fair warning, this section has some pretty dark content in it, but there's chapters down below, so feel free to skip ahead to the next one. Remember the Got Milk campaigns that we all grew up on? Well, PETA thought that it would be wise to run an anti-milk campaign on a billboard in Newark. But what text do you think they used? Not milk? Stop milk? What about Got Autism? The billboard claimed that there was a link between cow's milk and autism. Obviously, they were asked to cite their sources, and they provided two. Those studies made up for a total of 35 kids, and it showed literally no link between cow's milk and autism. Basically, they had a couple of autistic kids in these polls, and they correlated that similarity as the causation of, you know, their autism. Pretty messed up. The ad company got a ton of backlash, and that eventually got pulled, thankfully. But this next one just blows my mind. The Westminster Dog Show in New York City happens every year, and in 2009, PETA decided that they'd had enough. So they dressed up in KKK robes, holding signs that said, Welcome KKK members, register here for Westminster, pure breeds only. What's the actual f***? I'm trying really hard not to have an opinion, but who thought this was a good idea? Who approved this decision? I don't think I need to explain to you why this is problematic, but if you ever find yourself in a situation where you're wearing a KKK robe, you're probably in the wrong. Obviously, this wasn't very effective, and it got PETA a ton of backlash, yet again. But for this third one, in 2004, PETA ran a campaign called Holocaust on Your Plate, where they published posters across cities in Germany and the US. Each poster had two photos. One was a still photo from concentration camps from the Holocaust of the Second World War, and the other side, photos of animals in farms and shelters. The text on some of these posters read, to animals, all people are Nazis. Listen, millions of people died in the Second World War, and glorifying any of that for any message is just outright unethical. 
But this is what PETA thrives on. They create outrage and give you comparisons that just don't make sense. Straight up, in the entirety of PETA's history, they've never had an issue with pushback on their campaigns. This stuff works for them because they either get shut down or they get a ton of good attention. And even the bad attention gets them attention. No press is bad press. PETA does this for a reason. It's all a part of their strategy. And I think there's more that we need to know here. For starters, let's take a look at their four core values. Number one, stop animal abuse whenever you can. Number two, animals have rights that deserve consideration. Three, animals are not ours to experiment on, eat, wear, or use. And four, oppose speciesism and the concept of pets. Let's break these all down one by one. Number one, stop animal abuse whenever you can. I think we can all agree that animal abuse is terrible. I don't really think we need to clarify that. But I did see that Netflix series, Don't Fuck With Cats, so I know that there is people out there who disagree. But what are you supposed to do to prevent animal abuse? Well, I guess the first step is to actually figure out what animal abuse even is. What they lump into these categories is super broad. Things like having birds in cages and using training devices are considered animal abuse by PETA, despite having legitimate reasons for existing. Even zoos are considered animal abuse by PETA. A lot of people come to the zoo with the mindset of they're going to Disneyland. They're going to have so much fun. But then in some way, you're like also being educated on these existential crises that are happening in the world. That's John, my friend from the Calgary Zoo, who I spoke to to get a bit more information. Kids are not going to be affected by a PETA rally. I think those things could affect like a politician and make them think twice about rules and regulations. But in terms of the next generation of humans, they're only going to be inspired to love and care for the environment by actually being able to be in a loving environment and a caring environment. And so I think zoos are huge for that, but also there's an onus on them to be able to provide real resources and not just leave it at kids running around thinking, oh, this is cool, I love animals, but also teaching them about what they can do to help animals. What does uh, conservation look like in a zoo? What is the ultimate goal? Most zoos to the d caliber of the Calgary Zoo will also have you know, conservation work that they're doing usually off-site or within the zoo, but not for public viewing. This is just for saving species. With the zoo, I think the best example is the whooping crane. So they have an off-site facility and they've actively been breeding them in captivity, helping raise them, and then releasing them into the wild. Oftentimes there's collaboration with other organizations such as in African countries or South American countries or places in Southeast Asia as well. Zoos often are providing their expertise and their funding towards those additional projects. I started to realize that PETA's beliefs weren't as clear cut as I thought they'd be. All right, let's break down a few more of the specific things that PETA's calling animal abuse. We mentioned earlier that the majority of household pets get adopted from shelters. These shelters fall under two categories, no-kill shelters and open admission shelters. No-kill shelters are great in theory, but they often overlook very sick or very old animals that might end up needing to be euthanized. With their ideas, you might think that PETA's shelter would be a no-kill shelter. But no, that's not the case. They actually consider themselves a shelter of last resort, a place for the animals that couldn't be loved anywhere else. All right, I wanna show you something, and I think that uh, this document's gonna help us understand this a bit better. So these are forms that PETA and any other animal shelter has to submit to the Department of Agriculture in Virginia to show the amount of animals they had going in and out of their shelters. If you actually open these up, one thing should stand out to you right away. The percentage of animals that they're euthanizing year after year. The worst one is from 2011. In this document, you can see that they took in 778 dogs and euthanized 713 of them. Of 1,214 cats coming in, 1,198 got euthanized. Euthanizing 97 to 99% of your animals is a huge problem. No shelter should ever be that high. So why do they do this? It doesn't matter who suffers, but that they suffer. And if there's something you can do about it, shake a leg. This track record stems back from their main core belief that pet ownership is a form of involuntary bondage. Their words, not mine. What this means is that PETA sees pet ownership as a form of animal suffering. In their view, they're helping the pets by euthanizing them. And PETA justifies this by saying that they take in sick and old dogs because of that last resort status. That seemed legit 
until 2014. In Virginia, a nine-year-old girl's chihuahua was picked up by two PETA representatives and brought to their shelter. The next day, the girl's father came to pick up the dog from PETA and clear up the confusion, except for one problem. PETA had euthanized the dog despite a law in Virginia stating that the animal had to be held for at least five days. The family sued, PETA was fined $500, and the family was paid $49,000. Oh, and they also had to make a $2,000 donation to the SPCA. Yeah, PETA, an animal charity, was forced to donate to another animal charity. I think that alone says a lot. So far, we've only talked about one pillar of PETA's beliefs, and you can probably already see how dangerous it is. So, what about the other beliefs? Animals have rights that deserve consideration. Animals are fascinating, beautiful living beings that we get to interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. Whether you're watching a squirrel or petting your dog, we can learn a ton from animals. Interaction with wildlife and wild environments is healthy for us and necessary. And increasingly, as we live in urban settings were very removed from nature. It's also necessary because we increasingly put at risk wild environments and wild animals. And if we don't have interaction with them, we won't do anything to to protect them or to mm -hmm. consider our actions towards them. Conservation is by far the most important thing we do to help animals thrive. We've taken over the world and built massive cities all across the globe. The very least we could do is help preserve the habitats and territories of the animals that still are wild. And no, of course, PETA has a different belief. Whether they're wild or domesticated, PETA believes that all animals have rights. But obviously I want to understand a bit more about what their concept of animal rights actually Actually is. If we were to compare animal rights to human rights, how would they stack up? Human rights are a set of clearly defined basic needs that must be met for all human beings. No matter your ethnicity, gender, religion, you have rights that you are entitled to. When you look more closely at different countries though, these rights will start to differ. For example, in the US it's considered a basic human right to be able to own a gun. Here in Canada, that's not the case. So when we look at PETA's vision for animal rights, it doesn't really line up. They don't have a set of clearly defined rights that these animals deserve. It's more like one principle. To PETA, animal rights means freedom from human control. If you want to use that to guide a principle, you should at least take something that works. In some cases, we as human beings can't even provide for our own species. So how can you fight for animal rights when your own kind is suffering? It would be perfect to just maintain these ecosystems as is. But a lot of the most interesting animals are in the most biodiverse parts of the world, which this has always been weird to me as well. Some of the most biodiverse hotspots of the world are also some of the poorest areas for humans and have some of the worst living conditions where people are really struggling to survive. How do you go in and try to protect an animal while ignoring that there's all this human suffering around you? You can't do that. You have to make sure that people living there are living the quality of life that you and I can expect too. Mm -hmm. You can take the burden of protecting them onto people in other countries and other places that can have the freedom to put effort into, like I think about all the zookeepers that care for the animal. They're just dedicating so much of their lives to protecting and caring for these animals physically every single day. Well, that means that their other needs are met as humans. <sighs> It's a complicated thing. PETA likens this idea of animal rights to racism, homophobia, and sexism. The biggest problem is that they oversimplify the concept of animal rights. Simply saying that animals have the ability to suffer isn't enough to actually motivate change. But it gets worse. PETA doesn't believe that animals have a right to live. What they do believe is that by euthanizing the animals that they do, they're ending their suffering. This is where things get a little dark. The motivations behind PETA are starting to look less like animal justice and more like playing God to fit my beliefs. They've euthanized healthy animals many times in the past with no justification, but piecing it together, you can see what their vision is. Still not done though. Let's take a look at the last two of PETA's beliefs. Number three not ours to experiment on, eat, wear, or use. One of PETA's really early wins was their development of a frog model for dissections. According to PETA, millions of frogs are being captured from their natural habitats every year and killed for classroom dissections. Schools have always justified this as a great way to learn about anatomy and biology in the real world. When I was in school, we dissected a cow's eyeball, and I'm gonna be honest, I don't think that any of that information applies to my real life. 
at all. With their success, they developed a belief that animals are not ours to experiment on, eat, wear, or use. Which again, it sounds great at a high level, but let's break it down further and see if it also falls apart. Let's start by talking animal testing. According to the Humane Society of America, over 50 million animals are forced to endure painful experimentation every year. From dogs to cats to monkeys and most notably rats. The idea behind animal testing is that you try it on animals, see if it works, and then test it on human beings. But once you actually look at the data, animal testing just doesn't make sense. 90% of the drugs that are tested successfully on animals end up failing clinical trials on humans anyways. And technological methods of testing using reproduced human cells have actually been created. Plus, the suffering on animals that are being tested on is well documented for years. That part is fair. Now let's talk leather and fur. This was one of their biggest focuses for a long time, getting us to stop wearing animal materials. When we started wearing animals, especially here in Canada, it was done to make efficient use of every piece of an animal. Eat the meat, use the bones, wear the fur. But as we've developed alternatives, hunting for animals for the sole purpose of their furs has become unnecessary. Look at the faux fur that exists and even vegan leather. By the way, when did we start calling it vegan leather instead of pleather? I don't know when that happened, but it did. There's something to be said about the environmental damage that plastic-based alternatives create, but overall, I'd say this is a good thing. So long as we're not wasting animal furs because there's no demand for them. But the last few points are a lot less clear cut to me. Eating animals is an essential part of the diet in a lot of cultures. And more importantly, we can tell people to go vegan, but we fail to consider how privileged of a mindset that is. How are you gonna tell someone who's fighting for their next meal that they can't eat an animal? And what about the people who just flat out can't go vegan because of dietary restrictions. We can support the rights of animals by not eating them, but that fails to consider the countless animals that also eat other animals. Listen, I was vegetarian for almost two years, and it's not something that I oppose doing again. But there's also a huge difference between eating mass packaged meats and going to your local farmer's market to get the latest cuts. Usually these animals are raised much better, and they're probably healthier for you too. There's a lot of nuance to this argument that general label of beliefs fails to consider. That being said, there are problems that need to be addressed within our food chain. And also, in my opinion, before we start worrying about who's eating what, let's make sure that everyone's eating. Now, let's also talk about what they mean by use. In most cases, this means using animals for our entertainment. How can they ensure that the zoos they're going to are being responsible and taking care of these animals properly and also have a vested interest in the wild species as well? First and foremost, just make sure they're PETA approved. <laughs> if you are looking for that sort of stamp of approval by an organization that cares, AZA, you can look at that and the zoo like at their entrance would have like that sticker or that logo, or you can just go to their website and see what zoos fall under their, uh, under their organization. But beyond all of that, I would say it is to trust your intuition. You know, like if you're in this environment and it just feels bad, then, you know, you're probably not wrong. Like if this animal really, but then also watch your intuition too, because I do get a lot of people that come to the zoo and they'll watch a gorilla for one minute and they'll come up to me and say, oh, this animal is so bored. Like it must just have such a sad life here. It's like, well, wait a minute. You are watching this animal while it is having a midday nap. Any species, humans as well, if we're just sleeping, you're going to look and be like, oh, what a miserable soul. It's like, well, you're sleeping, okay? <laughs> you can't judge the quality of life based on that one moment. So be careful with your intuition. But I would say any smart and sensitive person will be able to tell. This belief revealed a trend to me that I was starting to notice. There is so much more depth to these arguments than they're actually accounting for. People want to support organizations that do a lot of work, but doing a lot of things means doing very little in-depth actual work on any topic. When it comes to PETA, they have a ton of really wide-ranging beliefs, but it's really hard to actually act on them. So I suppose it's time to actually explore their biggest and potentially worst belief. Four, oppose speciesism and pets. I think this belief is best summarized by asking one single question. What does PETA think about pets? Now, they don't believe that pets should be set free as you might be thinking at this point, but they do not support the future breeding of pets. According to them, there are already way too many pets to be taken care of properly right now. So they oppose breeders and the pet industry and focus a lot of their efforts on spay and neuter programs. Listen, animal overpopulation could become a massive problem, but responsible breeding practices kind of prevent this. For this one, I want to go back 
to their belief about animal suffering specifically. They see pets as existing in a state of suffering under human control. This is what they consider speciesism. Everything that involves humans interacting with animals is considered speciesism by PETA. What would it look like if animals had to re-enter the wild? How long would that take if they were coming from captivity? And could they even come back to the wild from captivity? I don't even really know how to address that. And I think that's actually the answer is that we don't know how to address that, which is exactly why we cannot give silver bullet answers, black and white things of these animals must be returned to the wild. We have to admit, we don't even really know what the wild is today. The wild certainly isn't what it was 500 years ago. This whole breeding program, the species survival plan, it's for the survival of their species, not just to be maintained within zoos, but in case their species goes extinct in the wild. So we say mm. it would be tragic if gorillas went extinct in the wild, but it would be ultimately tragic if they went extinct in the wild and there was literally no gorillas at all on earth. They were all extinct. If they went extinct in the wild or their numbers continued to decrease, then you could start a program to slowly begin to repopulate them. And I say slowly because these gorillas that have been born within the zoo, it wouldn't be them getting released, but it would be the next generation beyond them because there would be a learning curve between getting the gorillas accustomed to a wild environment again. If they want zoos to be shut down, you're gonna be losing a lot more than entertainment. This belief is the broadest one of them all. And they make the solution to the problem that they're sharing really hard to understand. Either you set the animals free or you euthanize all of them. But all I know is that both of those options are really bad for the animals and the humans. I've been deep in PETA's beliefs, ad campaigns, and everything they stand for for a few weeks. And the one question that I keep coming back to is, why? Why do they do what they do? I have more papers. These are the documents that PETA submitted to the federal government going over their income and their expenses for the year of 2021. Hidden in these documents, I found three things that stand out as potential reasons for why they do what they do. The first thing that stood out to me was that the CEO, Ingrid Newkirk, who we talked about a little while ago, she only makes $36,000 a year, which kind of disproves that she's doing this for the money, right? Now she does do speaking engagements and she's involved with other charities, but there's no way to prove that she makes more money through these methods. So I think we got to keep looking. On the next page, you'll see that they paid $500,000 to one law firm in that same year. And and a couple of pages later, you can find that they paid over $1.7 million in other legal fees. Initially, one of the claims I'd heard from other people exploring this topic was that they have a ton of lawsuits going on for ridiculous reasons. For example, a wildlife photographer spent some time with some monkeys in 2011. He let one of them play around with his equipment and eventually discovered that one of the monkeys had taken a selfie. PETA sued this photographer on behalf of the monkey. They claimed that the photo was owned by the animal and that the money earned from the photo should be going back to it in some way. Obviously, this was a little ridiculous, but fast forward to 2017 and a court settled that 25% of all future revenue from that photo would go towards a charitable organization supporting that breed of monkey. I could go on and on, but PETA has a pretty clear track record of suing for power. But only a few million dollars of $68 million in expenses going towards lawsuits, this can't be it. However, as soon as I started reading these documents, one major thing stood out to me. Media and press support, 5.5 million. Postage and shipping, 3.9 million. And education, promotion, and communication, 6.7 million. More than anything else, it seems like PETA's donations are going towards spreading their messages. At that moment, when I went through all those documents, I genuinely believed I understood what was going on. It couldn't be that they were seeking out money or power, but they wanted to normalize really tough conversations. I've been labeling throughout the video a lot of what PETA does as outrage activism. There's no solution, mm. but if you can get mad about it, they've achieved their goal. But mm. there's no impact, there's no result that you can actually have with that. Outwardly, publicly, they are the noisiest and they are the loudest and making the most amount of noise about the work that they are doing to save animals from all these different issues. But I think that's the fundamental problem is that they're too noisy and talking too much about what they're doing and about these horrible issues, but they're just doing a normal amount of work, which is, you know, laudable, but doesn't match up with 
their public persona. You talk about these really extreme commercials from PETA. I see what you're doing. You're trying to guilt people into thinking a certain way. The opposite of that is cultivating a love for animals and for nature. And that doesn't come from these scare tactics or looking at all the horrible atrocities going on. That comes from being able to engage with these animals which is something that good quality zoos can provide, but also to engage with the ecosystems. Until you can understand that environment even a little bit, you can't as well think about what conservation work would be like for those animals in the wild. Now, here's the thing. I personally believe that no one does anything with bad intent, but when it comes to PETA, it seems like they do a lot more things out of hate than they do out of good. On top of that, they present you with a ton of problems and zero solutions. So when they show you animal suffering, they leave you to consider and feel guilt for something that is not within your control. And here's the thing. If they truly cared, that $16 million that's going towards marketing would be going towards making a difference. I should clarify that I worked in the pet industry for about four or five years and I had a ton of conversations about PETA. They assumed that because they were fighting for animal rights, they must be good. But I don't know, animal rights aren't necessarily what we want. We want to support animal welfare. I truly, like most people, believe that pets should be cared for properly. I know that there's a lot of people that don't know how to do that, but I don't know that the answer is that they shouldn't be pet owners. I think it's better that we educate them. PETA's not giving you solutions and PETA's not trying to help you learn. They're weaponizing something that you think you have to support to force their opinions on you. And I don't, I don't like that. It's, it's not cool. And here's the thing. PETA stands for People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, but I genuinely don't believe that their ethics are very good. John wanted me to tell you to go check out the Wilder Institute, which is the conservation half of the Calgary Zoo by going to their website and learning more about what they do. But right now, I think just Instagram at Jack Plumley is the best way to reach me. And once you're done that, check out this video that I made here about the fast food industry. See you guys in a few weeks.